in this class we will start second law of thermodynamics uh, we have already learned first law of thermodynamics which is a statement of the conservation of energy that means when we give heat energy what part of it will be converted to internal energy of the system or temperature and what part is used to do work etc but second law of thermodynamics unlike other laws of physics is a negative statement this law came into being when car not tried to make uh, some heat engines heat is a peculiar type of energy we can easily convert other forms of energy to heat energy for example if you just rub your hand heat energy is produced their mechanical energy is converted to heat energy now in uh, bulbs and also in ironing machines and all electrical energy is converted to heat energy so it's easy from any other form of energy to get heat energy but to convert heat energy to another form of energy is a very difficult task so can not try to convert heat energy to mechanical energy or work and for that he try to devise a heat engine and then from the practical difficulties he came up with he formulated the second law of thermodynamics and subsequent experiments led to different statements of the second law of thermodynamics let us see what are those statements first of all let us see what is carnot statement carnot states that no engine can be built which can extract fixed amount of heat and convert it completely to work he didn't tell that it is not possible to take fixed amount of heat and convert it to work it is possible what is not possible is to convert it completely to work so we cannot take some heat energy from some place and convert it completely to work which is not possible at all practically so this statement he came up with after kind of doing a lot of experiments and trying to make a perfect heat engine and he found that it is not possible not only practically theoretically also it is not possible so that is the first negative statement see all these statements are negative in nature so no heat engine can be built which can extract fixed amount of heat and convert it completely to work so negative statement now let us see what cauchy state it's the same idea but in a different way stated it is not possible for a self acting machine unaided by an external agent to convey heat from a body at lower temperature to a body at higher temperature we know that naturally heat flows from a hot body to a cold body and the reverse is not possible not possible unaided by an external agent which means it will be possible even to make the heat flow from cold body to hot body but for that we need an external agent we need an external machine or external aid to do so so here using the carnot statement we can devise it is important when we devise a heat engine when we try to convert heat energy to work this carnot statement becomes more evident like we have to take care that it is not possible to convert all the energy that is taken as heat to work now cauchy statement is more evident or it is more important when we try to create a refrigerator what is a refrigerator or a cooler it is cooling some body be below the surrounding temperature so it is keeping one part of a system 
lower than its surrounding temperature and we continuously want to remove heat from there. That's what is happening in a cooler or in a refrigerator. So when we try to construct a refrigerator or a cooler, this closure statement is very important because it is not possible. Again, it's a negative statement. It's not possible for a self-acting machine unaided by an external agent to convey heat from a body at lower temperature to a body at higher temperature. Of course, we know naturally it is not possible, but he tells that it is not possible for self-acting machine unaided by external agent, which gives us a hint that if we use an external agent, it will be possible. So do you understand these two statements and where they become important? Do you understand these statements? Yes. Okay. Now let us go to Planck statement, which is similar to Carnot statement. Planck statement says that it is impossible to construct a engine which can extract heat continuously from a source and convert it completely to work. See, it's similar to what Carnot told, right? No engine can be built. It is impossible to construct an engine. Same, which can extract heat continuously from a source and convert it completely to work. And to extract fixed amount of heat and convert it completely to work. What Planck added is continuously. So uh, in a heat engine, for example, in a um, car, we use a heat engine where we are taking the petrol, it burns and the heat energy produced just used to run the car where we are converting heat energy to mechanical energy. So in such heat engines, we're continuously taking heat from the source and completely converting it to work is not possible. A lot of energy will be lost, only a part of it can be converted to work. So Planck statement is a modification of Carnot statement itself. Now let us see Kelvin statement. Kelvin statement says that continuous. See, like Planck statement, it added continuous, but it is in other way a statement of the closure statement, uh, statement of second law. Kelvin statement states that continuous flow of energy cannot be obtained from a substance cooling it below the coolest part of its surroundings. So continuously, we cannot take uh, energy from a cooler body and give it to a hotter body. We cannot cool some part of the uh, substance below its surroundings. That's what we are doing in the refrigerator. That's what we are doing when we are using a cooler, when we are using an AC in a room. We are again and again continuously taking uh, heat from the cool room and giving it to the sur surroundings, which is outside where it is hot. So it's not possible continuously. That is stated by Kelvin's uh, law. And Clochus also told that it is not possible unless it is aided by an external agent. So now, when you, yes. Yeah. Can we Sorry. compare these statements with uh, hot water and cold water? Yeah. When we consider hot water and cold water, if we keep them in contact, what naturally occurs? Naturally? temperature will go from hot body to cold body. It will never go from, suppose these two are vessels containing hot water and cold water. When we connect, what happens is naturally heat will flow from hot body to cold body, right? They are telling it is not possible to take the temperature from cold water and give to hot water. It's not possible. So all this statement is telling not possible. It is not possible. See, all these statements are negative, not obtained, not. So all these four statements are negative. They are telling it is not possible to take heat from a cold body or cold liquid and give it to a hot liquid. It is not possible. 
but they give us a clue if we use some external agent it is possible so that's what we are going to see after the second law of thermodynamics when we learn how a refrigerator works we will see how it is possible with the help of an external agent is that okay is that okay okay so uh, i think you will have to memorize these statements they may ask you any particular statement of the second law of thermodynamics so you will have to memorize the statement they may ask the statement for one mark any one they can mention any of these four names now when we are going in detail Uh, to study how a heat engine works and how a refrigerator works we need to know some idea about uh, reversible and irreversible processes what are reversible process processes which can be reversed like it is a process which can be retraced in the opposite direction so that the system and the surrounding pass through exactly the same state at each stage as in the direct process for example if you are keeping a glass of water in a freezer what happens it will become we are keeping water in freezer what happens it will become cold it will become cold and it will become ice right later when we keep that glass of ice outside what will happen for some times if we keep it outside it will be uh, back to its normal position yeah it will come back to its normal temperature or it will turn back to liquid right so it's an example for reversible process it can be retraced in the opposite direction and uh, system and the surrounding pass through exactly the same state earlier we took the temperature or took the heat energy from it and when we kept it outside we the heat energy entered into the system so it's a perfect example for a reversible process now what is a irreversible process it is a process which is not exactly reverse that is the system does not pass through the same intermediate state as in the direct process for example suppose you are boiling an egg okay you boil some you take a egg and you boil it what happens inside the egg the egg hardens the egg hardens earlier it was liquid it becomes solid when you boil it now can you bring back to the earlier stage no no so it's a reversible process so cooking is a reversible process you cannot bring it back to the uh, earlier state now working substance returns to its initial state in a reversible process and the working substance cannot return to its initial state in an irreversible process and reversible process are usually very slow while irreversible process are very fast i will tell you one example when we burn a cracker when we burn a cracker it's a irreversible process it's a fast process but you can never get back what you burned right it's a chemical process and it's very fast and you cannot get back what you uh, what you have gone through now reversible processes are not spontaneous process reversible processes are not naturally occurring processes most of the reversible process for example when you uh, just uh, put a for example if you want to for a chemical reaction to take place it occurs spontaneously but the reverse is not possible also when we consider a nuclear reaction a bomb exploding all of them 
acts spontaneously and it is very fast but they are all reversible process most of the processes that we see around us are irreversible processes they occur spontaneously they are very fast but you cannot retrace them now in a reversible process this process the thermodynamic equilibrium is maintained throughout which means the it will be very slow and the temperature of the immediate surrounding and the body will be almost coming to a thermodynamic equilibrium for example as i told before when we are taking some water and keeping it in a refrigerator uh, it's a slow process where the water cools down and as it cools down it try to reach a thermodynamic equilibrium with its surroundings the system try to get at the same temperature of its surroundings but in a irreversible process the thermodynamic equilibrium is not maintained it's fast so when you consider a adiabatic process and all or uh, the burning of a candle for example all of them do not maintain any thermodynamic equilibrium but they are spontaneous they are fast and they are irreversible most of the naturally occurring processes are irre irreversible now i will show you some pictures you have to tell me which of these are reversible and which of these are irreversible so the first one this one is it reversible or irreversible reversible reversible because uh, juice changing into ice and this ice stick can be changed back to juice if you just keep it outside in a glass it will turn back to juice now what about this one is this reversible it's all reversible. reversible right if you have tried cooking with chocolate you know that you can melt a bar of chocolate you can change the shape or something like that and you can get back it in the solid form so this is also an example for reversible process see all of this you need to do some effort continuously right now let us consider this case is this a it is a irreversible process you cannot give bring back the sunny side up cook deck back to its original form it's not possible it's retra not retraceable Now, what about this one? Wood burning. Irreversible. Irreversible. So you cannot change the ashes back to wood. And what about this rusting of iron? Rusting of iron. It's also irreversible process. You can just remove the rust. by scratching again it gets rusted so you are losing the content you are losing matter there so it's an irreversible process you cannot get it back to its original it's a chemical reaction right most of the chemical reactions are irreversible and what about this one is it reversible or irreversible irreversible, irreversible process see again the candle you cannot get it back so you just need to know what are what is reversible and what is irreversible processes okay now let us see what is meant by a heat engine what is a heat engine the device that converts heat energy to mechanical energy is called a heat engine now what are the parts of a heat engine how it works heat engine has a hot body or a hot source of heat and it has a working substance or a engine itself then it has a cold body which is called a sink the engine or the working substance will absorb heat from the hot body which is called the source and a part of this heat energy is converted to work and the rest of the energy is given back to the sink so 
for a ideal heat engine we assume that this hot source of heat is an infinite source of heat energy however heat energy we take from the hot body it's not going to reduce its temperature it's a it's an ideal hot source this is our assumption when we ever think of a ideal heat energy and we assume that zinc the sink where we give the heat energy is ideal however amount of heat energy we give to it uh, it's not going to raise its temperature so the, the temperature of the hot source and the cold sink will remain the same this is our assumption so that we can uh, completely uh, we can extract continuously a fixed amount of heat q1 here and we can give back a fixed amount of heat q2 that's an ideal assumption now here we remember the carnot statement that you cannot absorb some amount of heat energy and completely convert it to work which means q2 cannot be zero q2 is zero means whatever heat energy we are taking will be completely converted to work which is not possible according to carnot's statement also according to planck statement it's not possible to extract heat from a hot source and completely convert it to work which means q2 cannot be equal to zero and what will be the work done work done will be the difference between these two q1 minus q2 so let's read this the heat engine absorbs heat from a source of higher temperature and converts a part of it to work and rejects the remaining part of heat to a sink at lower temperature and the initial condition is is restored now to get continuous supply of work the cycle of operations are to be repeated this is to be repeated and the working substance is usually a gas in a cylinder fitted with a piston so let us see how this is done what is the cycle is this clear to you what is meant by heat engine and what are the three different parts of a heat engine is that clear everything yes, yes. okay now let us uh, see what is the efficiency of a heat engine see if the high temperature source have a temperature t1 t1 represents the temperature of source and t2 represents the temperature of the sink which is at low temperature t2 is the temperature of sink now q1 is the amount of heat from the source to the heat engine so q1 is the heat flow from source to heat engine q2 is the heat rejected from the heat engine to the sink then the work done w will be equal to q1 minus q2 because energy can be neither lost nor obtained so we can say that for balance of energy q1 minus q2 is equal to w now when we talk about efficiency efficiency always means what output we get divided by what we supply so efficiency this is the symbol called eta efficiency eta is equal to work output divided by energy supplied so work output is w divided by the energy given is q1 so w by q1 we know that w is equal to q1 minus q2 so q1 minus q2 by q1 so q1 is a common denominator it applies for this q1 and for q2 so you can write q1 by q1 as 1 minus q2 by q1 so this is one of the expressions for efficiency eta is equal to q2 minus q, q1 minus q2 by q1 so you have to remember this expression for efficiency also we know that more the temperature more heat energy can be absorbed and also therefore 
q1 by q2 is equal to t1 by t2. So the amount of heat energy absorbed from the source is directly proportional to the temperature of the source and the amount of heat energy given to the sink also depends upon the temperature of the sink. So their ratios are equal. So q1 by q2 is equal to t1 by t2. So we can substitute instead of q2 by q1, Oh, put it in a, another way, T1 by T2. So it will be, yeah, I think there is some uh, confusion here. You just remember this, this one I will discuss later. So I will come back to this. Now let us see Carnot's engine. What is meant by Carnot's engine? Carnot's engine is an ideal heat engine. I told in the beginning that Carnot is the scientist who tried to do a lot of experiments to develop a heat engine. So Carnot proposed an ideal engine to convert heat energy to mechanical energy which is free from all imperfections of an actual engine. Now, the working substance is in a Carnot engine is a ideal gas. So the working substance is taken through a cycle of operations known as Carnot cycle. Let us see how it works. Here, this is the, these are the parts of a Carnot engine. Here you have some gas, the working substance, which is usually ideal gas, enclosed in a cylinder fitted with a frictionless piston. Now here, this part of this cylinder is insulated. It's an insulated wall. And here down, you have a conducting base. So this is a gas cylinder where there is ideal gas, and a frictionless piston, we can move it up and down. And then there is, it is insulated from the surrounding, except at the base where it is conducting. Now you have a source which is very hot and it's an ideal source. You have an insulating pad and you have a sink. So these are the parts of a Carnot engine. So is it clear what are the parts of a Carnot engine? Is the part yes. of a, Okay, so let us see how a Carnot engine works. Carnot engine goes through a cycle. So first of all, it goes through an isothermal expansion. How? This is the cylinder. This is that cylinder with a ideal gas and a frictionless piston attached to it. Now, first of all, we keep this on the heat source so that heat energy is absorbed. So when heat energy is absorbed slowly, what happens to the ideal gas? It will expand. While expanding, it's temperature becomes almost equal to that of the temperature of the heat source. So it's an isothermal expansion, means its temperature remains same as the temperature of the source. So it goes from state A to B, it's called isothermal expansion or slow expansion. So the gas expands slowly. Now, once the gas expands slowly, it's isothermal expansion. Now, what happens is after that, it is kept on the insulating pad. Remember, we have a hot source and an insulating pad. So first, it is kept on the hot source. So heat is absorbed from the source and there is isothermal expansion heat energy is taken by the ideal gas. And after isothermal expansion, it is kept on the insulating pad. See, no heat energy flow. Now it is on the insulating pad. 
when it is go from B to C, which means when it is kept on the insulating pad, it expands by itself because the gas inside is very hot. So it will expand and it will cool down because I don't want to stay at that high temperature position. So just to cool down, you know that in an adiabatic expansion, it can cool down. So to cool down, what the gas does is, gas will undergo an adiabatic expansion. So during adiabatic expansion, what happens? Some of the, uh, it, do, it does some work and it cools down. Now, when it is cooled down, again, it is kept on the cold reservoir. Yeah, see, it goes from C to D. See, from C to B, C to D, what happens when it goes in this way? It's isothermal compression. So what we do now is, now we keep this expanded gas cylinder on the cooling on the sink and we will compress, which means we will do some work on it. Here, when it expands, the gas is doing some work, right? So the gas absorbs some heat energy, does the work. Now we are doing work on the gas. We are compressing it, keeping it on the sink. So what happens, those energy that it was it uh, absorbed in the first place, part of it gets converted to work and the rest of the heat energy, it will give to the zinc. So it will give energy to the zinc when it undergo isothermal compression. There we are doing work on the system when it goes from C to D. And from D to A, what happens? We will take it from the zinc and again keep on the insulated pad. And we will suddenly compress it. We will make the gas undergo adiabatic compression. So see, it goes from D to A. So it's adiabatic compression. So this is the cycle through which the gas will go. Again, the gas will undergo isothermal expansion, adiabatic expansion, then isothermal compression, adiabatic compression, isothermal expansion. So the cycle will continue itself. And in the process, what's happening? The gas, which is inside the cylinder, is absorbing heat, doing work, rejecting the extra heat to the sink. Again, we are doing work on it. Then again, absorbing heat, doing work. So it continues. So the cycle continues. Is it clear how a car not engine works? What is the cycle? Is it clear to you? Yes, teacher. Okay. So this is how a car not engine works. Now we will see more about the work done in a car not cycle in the next class.